This is Kelly Schaefer from Till the Dirt, and you are listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Turn it up. Hey, there you are. How are you, my friend? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. How's everything going? Everything's great. How's the family? Really good. Really good. It's, uh, it was nice to come home after tour. Yeah, I was looking at your pictures and finally catching up with your son again after being out. Yeah, yeah. Hitting the beach. And uh, yeah, it's been nice. It's been nice for sure. I know this is... Early. I'm doing well. Thanks, man. I know this is yeah. early for you. Usually we try and do them later in the day, but... <laughs> yeah, I just I just wrote our publicist and I was like, hey, man, uh, you know, for future, uh, I'm a much better interview afternoon. <laughs> he sent me the thing and said, hey, 11 o'clock. I'm like, well, OK, sure. I've been trying to get Kelly on for a while, but it doesn't work out because he's late and I'm early. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you're worth getting up early for my friend. <laughs> uh, cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time. And last time we talked, you had sent us the uh, the demos of this stuff or a couple of these. It's great to see them finally coming to fruition. What's that feel like? Oh, man, you know, with COVID and everything it took, you know, obviously COVID was the reason why this came together and, and how this came together just from the isolation of, of um, you know, being able to really just kind of be at home all the time. And, and, uh, and so that's how this came to be. But also the double-edged sword of it was that it took, you know, a lot of labels were very backed up with, a, with their releases. And so it took two and a half years to get this thing out. <laughs> so, two and a half uh, years, you got to write on to Nuclear Blast, though. I mean, that's a pretty big uh, step in itself, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know that me and Scott Burns talked about, you know, there was a period of time where we were, you know, wondering whether labels would, uh, you know, would be interested in it because it's different. And uh, and so there was a, even a talk of putting together a label. Scott was talking about putting together his own label and releasing it if nobody else did, because, you know, he believed in it that much. Right. It was a great feeling, you know, and uh, just having him work with me on it was was good enough. But the fact that he was willing to, uh, you know, put together his own label just to uh, to make sure that it saw the light of day was a blessing you, you know? work with scott a lot down there right you guys are partners pretty much no not at all um, i thought you worked a lot with scott down there in tampa well no back in the day yeah. sure i mean uh, 25 plus years ago uh, scott hasn't produced anything and um hasn't wanted to produce anything in uh, i think 25 years so oh, really? oh yeah yeah i mean i think the last thing he did was in the early 90s so oh, wow. um yeah, so he was responsible for all the old, you know, for those who don't know Scott Burns, uh, the, all the the new new breed kids. Uh, you know, he did obituary, morbid, cannibal corpse. I, you know, just the, the list goes on. You know, atheist, right. cynic. Uh, so whenever he bowed out back in the day, he he became a um, a software engineer and um, never really, you know, kind of got to go out on the record that he wanted to go out on and. Uh, in his own words and and um so we so whenever i presented him with these demos he was just really excited about it and excited for me and that made me excited and inspired and and um so we were able to work on this uh together and i think uh hopefully we'll work on any future till the dirt stuff together but uh yeah he, he's a he's a hard get <laughs> interesting that's great you got him back for that though so that's great yeah i was very very happy and uh, yeah, I mean, he's just got an incredible ear and an, an incredible knack for uh, no no bullshit, you know. And like, he's so brutally honest that uh, that it's it's for me that's refreshing because uh, there's nothing worse than you know. So what do you think? Oh, that yeah, sounds cool, you know. And no, 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 you know, you, you need you need somebody to go. Ah, it's garbage, right? You know, or, or uh, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, and um, you know, it's like they say, you don't represent yourself in court. You know, produce your own record. You know, you, need, you have somebody you know that could be, give, you know, they can give it to you the way you need to hear it. So, uh, so he was super helpful and all that. And so I would write songs each night and and send them, you know, send them to him, and and then we would talk on the phone, and he would say, yeah, I want to try this, maybe, you know, or an extra longer chorus, or or you know, when my vocals weren't, you know, where they needed to be, he was there. So it was it was done unconventionally um, compared to how we worked together back in on piece of time and on questionable presence. What was it like writing these songs? I mean, you were writing them in your in your house at the time, I think, when we talked yeah. about it, right? And then yeah. so did you go 
to the studio to redo them or did you kind of how did they morph into what they are now no what's great about this record is it's so in in a, in a in an era where everything is so perfect and pristine and and computerized and and you know what i mean and, and um fixed you know there's there's ton, there's tons of flaws on this record which i love you know i i love the fact that it was done um you know i, I tracked most of this myself um and i'm not a you know a studio guru by any means you know but right. just by default i i wanted to i wanted to keep the performances that i had um that i had done because what was happening is i was starting like i was starting the song at like 7 p.m and by 2 30 in the morning i was getting to where I, I had written the lyrics and and i would write vocals so a lot of these songs happened in one night uh and i wrote like 25 songs so i have you know a whole nother record right behind this one and uh so the vocals that i was doing you know i was having a couple drinks and you know you get the feeling more courageous and dangerous and uh and so i wanted to keep those keep that energy. And so the vocals, I feel like on this record, I, I, um, I've never sang like that before. You know what I mean? I've never had, uh, that kind of comfort level. Um, you know, usually the studio is very, uh, you know, you get, you just get in, you get in your head sometimes. And this was just that, ah, you know, I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about this even ever being an, an album or a band or, or any of that. And that's kind of hard to recreate or, or, or create that, that vibe and that that scenario because uh in every other instance you're writing towards something you're working towards a goal of oh okay i've got to write this album or, or i've got to you know write this song uh, but that was just never the case with this and i think that that lended itself to a, a genuine um honesty and uh you know no no pretentious no pre-thought of well you know I, where does this fit in or or how you know how will this you know there was just none of that shit at all it was just uh eh. You know, what do you think of this song? What do you think of that song? You know, and uh, but once we got to the end, um, I we did go and mix it at, at a at a at a proper studio, um, um, so that was that was a really um, kind of the only step outside of uh, a DIY kind of scenario. Right. <laughs> did you approach these songs like trying to be different, or did that just come out? Because I mean, it's it's death metal, but it's also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm listening this morning and. I almost hear some like '90s grungish kind of stuff in there as well. So, did you approach it that way, or did you? Uh, it just came out. You know, I mean, I think that that's what that that's kind of what um, led me to because what what happened was I was writing. I had set up a little studio, you know, a little laptop, and and got a studio one set up in a in a DAW, you know, to be able to work on writing riffs for Atheist. <laughs> and um, so I wrote like three hours worth of atheist riffs. And then along came this song outside the spiral. I wrote the whole song and then I did the the vocals. All that happened in one night. And, uh, and I just, I was like, man, this is really weird. This is an atheist. It's not, it's not like neurotica or anything like that. You know, like my old band. I, so I, I didn't really, that's kind of what spurred the whole thing was, uh, I don't know what this is, but it sounds different. So I send it to like, you know, uh, Gene Hoagland and Terrence Hobbs and, and, uh, Steve DiGiorgio said it to these different guys that I knew would, would kind of, you know, give me the, the real shit. And also, uh, a writer named Gunnar Sauerman, who was a really, he was our publicist on Jupiter at season of mist. And he was just a, he's a guy that he just didn't like atheist. And I knew that he would be honest with me <laughs> if I sent him this, threat. you know, he would, he would tell me the truth, you know? And, um, so I figured if I could make it, you know, if, if he says it's okay, then I'm probably on to something different because it had like a, had like a black metal vibe and I'm not a black metal guy at all. You know what I mean? Like it had a, um, just a dark, uh, icy kind of tone. So anyway, I, uh, yeah. So that first song happened and, um, and then I, I just, from, from there, I just, it, 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 that template just kept happening. Uh, but I love stoner rock and, you know, like my, I love old Sabbath, you know, my, my go-to is like, you know, Kaya Sabbath, um, you know, anything that's groovy and, and thick, you know, I love that. And you don't get to do a lot of that in death metal. And, you know, t and I also love this, you know, Soundgarden, old Soundgarden, especially, and, and, uh, and obviously Alice in Chains, you know, is a, is a, yeah. a, a you know, the Seattle vibe to me, uh, most of it was really, really good. You know, those two bands in particular. And, uh, so yeah, this, this hybrid sort of happened and, you know, Scotty heard that Scott Burns heard that, that vibe. And we just kind of thought, you know, that 
That's interesting that uh, that's what we thought would probably make it difficult to get it signed. Um, you know, uh, once I had a series of songs, because I had a whole bunch of songs and and uh, laid them on Scott and, and we were just trying to figure out where does this fit in? And it doesn't. And that's that's why Scott, I think, liked it. Because I mean, the thing he liked about all the bands back in the eighties, uh, in the early days of of Tampa death metal, was every band was different. You know, Obituary was different than Atheist. Atheist was different than Cynic. Cynic was different than Morbid Angel. Like so, you know, and uh, each band was original. So that's a big deal to Scott was the originality. And um, and this was definitely, you know, like it or not, this Till the Dirt is a very, uh, it's a very original. <laughs> you know, it's 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 different. You know, so it's going to take a while for maybe some people to. You know, to absorb it just because of the different hybrid quality of it, I think. But I think, you know, being outside of the box is something sort of cool, too. I mean, I don't know that atheist fans may gravitate towards it because it's not as progressive. But I think it on its own, like you listen to the what is outside the spiral. And I mean, I'm sucked into it. You you find new layers of it every time I listen to it. Right. You you have those black metal vocals at, at some point. But you do have that Seattle thing in the choruses. And there's like all this stuff going on at once. Yeah, it's um, you know, and, and it's it's listenable, you know. Yes. I mean, um, on on a level that's uh, that's that's interesting. Whereas, you know, sometimes for for people to listen to atheists, it's you know, you got to really be in that headspace, you know, to to be able to, to you know, an atheist is not background music at all. You really got to sit there and listen to it. Um, not that this is background music, right. but this is just a little it's easier good. to kind of to k- kind of groove to and listen to. So I think that. Um, yeah, that's a, it's it's fun to uh, to to have this, uh, you know, and I I still can't believe that, you know, this all came to fruition, and uh, you know we're we're sitting here talking about a, a record that's coming out in a couple of weeks, and uh, you know it's my first record since 2010, and it's also the first time I played guitar on on a record since 1993, wow. which is which is fun for me, you know, because I uh, it's the the rumor for you know a couple of decades is oh Kelly can't play guitar and you know he's got something wrong with his hand. There's all these different myths of what's wrong with my hand, you know, <laughs> and uh, and you know it's it's just uh, I can play guitar. I just can't stand and play, so I don't play on stage anymore. But I've never stopped playing guitar, and so for me it feels good. A little bit of redemption to to the folks that ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like, or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana. Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effing Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Definitely do. <laughs> That's perfect. Hey, is, is when you were writing this, is there any sort of message or takeaway you want your fans to walk away from after listening to Outside the Spiral? Yeah, um, yeah so, you know, with older fans, I would say... Um, you know, or people that were familiar with me with atheist, I would say, remember how confused and unsure you were about atheist and then look at how it played out and uh, look at how technical metal sort of became a, a forest of, of uh, yeah. bands, you know, as opposed to just a couple of trees, you know, atheist and cynic and, uh, and just keep that in mind for what's going on right now. So if it's, if it feels uncomfortable, uh, to listen to, that's good. You know what I mean? If, if you're conf- you know, confused about the hybrid quality of it, just allow, allow it to soak in a little bit because, you know, I, I've always said that I, you should never fully get a record the first time you hear it. You should never be like, Oh, I get it. There it is. And, uh, it's this, it's that. And, you know, sometimes it takes a few listens to, to really kind of go, Oh, all right. Holy shit. There's a lot of different vibes going on here. A lot of different things. And, um, so I would hope that they would give it the time and not just, um, you know, one of the worst things about getting reviewed, with a with a with a band a brand new band is a lot of guys like yourself you know if you're reviewing in a magazine uh you've got 10 cd reviews to do by the end of the week you throw it in one time real quick and then you you write your opinion and that opinion stays forever and ever and ever and then other people read that opinion and go well i don't like that kind of shit so i'm not even going to listen to it and so that's a really tough spot to be in as an artist because you know you just get moved off to the side so i would just hope that everybody will uh you know, allow yourself to do, you know, to absorb something new. It's definitely, um, 
you know, it's different. And, uh, you know, you're not supposed to sort of combine those qualities of Seattle and Stoner Rock with extreme metal. But um, who says that, really? I mean, right. Who, who cares? Well, I don't. I mean, I'm with you on that. I think that uh, you know that it's important that things like that do happen musically, and and uh, and I think that you get some really great moments uh, in music if if you allow that as a listener to to you know to happen. And um, and also, you know, when we were talking about the black metal thing, you know, because I know black metal people are very um, guarded, you know, with their music, and I understand that, but also understand that like my vocals before there was black metal like real like literally uh, genre my vocals have always been that way always been sort of high witchy kind of creator-esque um i was never a you know that that guy so um it, it people may think that it like i i use the term black metal because i know that kids today will will recognize that okay i like that kind of vocal as opposed to the deep you know growl so uh but it's really not in any in any other way black metal other than uh you know i just think that my vocals have been that way for a long time and it just happened to fall in line with a lot of uh you know a lot of black metal vocalists you know so but um but it's uh you know i also got to use my singing voice uh which most people in the atheist world never got to i never would use that voice in in um in an atheist context you know so uh so there's a lot of new new um new things happening, you know, and in my, you know, in terms of if somebody's a fan of something I've done in the past, uh, you know, there's some, some, some new gems. <laughs> but even if they're not, it's a good record, right? I mean, we were just talking about, you know, things morphing and I think music has to sort of change and morph and evolve, right? You can't keep writing the same records and you can't keep writing the same genre, same tempo, same bullshit, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't, I mean, um, certainly there are many who do, uh, and, 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 right. you know, and they may have some success at it. And, and I think that was one of the reasons why Scott hasn't produced a record in a long time is because a lot of the things that were, were offered to him were just basically the same offerings. Yeah, that, uh, stuff, Right. Yeah. And so when he heard this, it, you know, the, the funny thing is I, you know, he, he, we had such a great conversation the first time we reconnected after 20 years. And when I told him I had new music, he, he wasn't exactly like, he was kind of uh, a little worried that he was going to have to, you know, call me back and be like, Oh man, you know, we had such a great conversation, <laughs> but this, this sucks. Right. I'm going to fuck it up. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, there was never, you know, um, in the beginning it was just you know friends talking and, and um and at the end of the conversation i was like oh by the way i have some new music and he was like oh okay and uh, <laughs> so i sent it and, and then uh so the rest happened from there so that was that was cool you know it was a a, a good feeling you know that and it's it's nice as a musician to not to have happy accidents happen like that and and um when we were talking about flawed when i when i when i say it's flawed i just mean that it's it's you know, there, there are, mis there's mistakes on there and there's, there should be mistakes on every record. You know, um, even I heard Steven Tyler talking about, an, uh, um, sweet emotion. And in the beginning, there's that, uh, I forget the name of that instrument that they use, but the instrument broke on, uh, when they were doing the actual take in the beginning and, uh, and they left it on there. Um, I saw, um, the police, uh, Stuart Copeland was talking about, um, Oh, what's I, I I can't think of the song for the police, but there's a in the beginning of the song, Sting was waiting uh, to do his vocal, and he sat on a piano, and 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 that his butt like made a chord, and then he started laughing, and uh, they left that on the beginning of the song, and it's such a classic moment. So there's a lot of those things that I hear on this record uh, that you know that I just left on there. You know, I mean, I did these vocals sitting in a in in you know in my house um uh, with my three-year-old at the time watching paw patrol right. like literally not, not in a not in a vocal booth uh i didn't i used a 58 uh, which is a handheld microphone yeah. uh everything about it is wrong 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 you know it, you're not supposed to do it that way and uh but that's the way i did it and then i left it that way i didn't go back in and redo them because i again i wanted to keep those those two o'clock in the morning performances you know and and uh you know, and I've, I've said in a couple of other interviews and, and it's hard to, to, to not cheapen this, but I, uh, or, or sound cheap in this, but I've never written music while having beverages, you know, like having shots. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so I, it, you know, anybody that goes out and has a couple of drinks, knows you feel a little, a little more talkative, a little more courageous. Uh, you, you know, you're able to communicate in it on a different level. Well, you translate that to music and that's why it's, this record sounds so angry and so, uh, so different, um, than, 
pissy in it. And then I always try to find words to describe, but it's, it just sounds, um, you know, much different than, than I've ever sounded before. So I could really kind of feel very third person about it. You know, like I can listen, like I, I would wake up the next day and, and listen and just be like, who is that guy? And it's uh, many ways you think about, you know, when you go out and you have a couple of drinks and you think about it the next day, like, Oh God, I hope I didn't right, say anything did I bad say? to Tom. Right. I hope I didn't say anything bad to Sally. Uh, you know, um, you know, you just tend to be a little more vocal and, uh, and that, that lent itself to this record. And so that became my little formula, you know, okay, I'm going to have a couple of Jaeger bombs and then let's, let's go, you know, let's, uh, right. let's see what we get into tonight, you know? And, uh, before I knew it, I had 25 songs sitting in front of me and going, now what do I do? You know, what do I do with these? So, yeah, it's, it was cool. So, Everything about this has been a cool experiment. <laughs> that to me seems like the older way of doing it, right? The more classic way of recording and doing records and making music. And it's it's raw, it's real, and it's organic, right? A yeah, lot absolutely. of people now are doing records where everything is perfectly quantized and everything is perfectly gated. And so I see what you're saying. And I think that makes a difference, really. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I've now I will I will say that this was the first you know, with, with all the atheist records that we ever made, we never used a click track or any of that. Everything was very, um, very, uh, alive and, 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 you know, speeding up and slowing down. I did play most of this to a grid, you know, but the performances within the grid are flawed, you know, and in, in the sense right. that, um, I, I, you know, I also I've tuned down a lot. So, uh, the playing, playing in B and the key of B, uh, I've never, you know, all the atheist stuff is in 440 E. So it's all, uh, so playing, playing down that low, a lot of times you hit the, you strike the string and it goes just a little out of tune. And so if you have four guitars and they're just a little bit out, um, I like that shit. You know, I, 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 I like that flaw, you know, I mean, I don't want it to be perfect. Right. Um, so you'll hear songs like forest because, um, you know, when it hit, the, when you hit the down, it's like, you know, they're just slightly out, out of tune a little bit. And, uh, and it makes it just, I don't know. It just, it lends itself to a, uh, to a, to a rawness that, that, uh, you know, these days would, uh, a normal studio engineer or producer would, would be like, Oh, we got to fix that. Yeah, it's, it's a little, it's a tiny bit out of tune, you know? And, um, and so I, I like those things. I like those mistakes and vocally as well. Um, because I did the vocals the way they did, uh, you know, the way I did with a handheld mic. Sure. I could have gone in to, um, to do them in the studio with a proper pantyhose in front of the microphone and, <laughs> right. you know, and done it like that. But I was like, I, I don't know that I'll be able to recreate that two 30 in the morning way I felt when I was, you know, screaming, <laughs> you know, like, right. like you know, so I, uh, I just left it all like it was and, and for better, or for worse. And, and it turned out good. You know, it turned out cool. So. so I know we're getting to the end here, but any plans on putting this on the road? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I hope, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I just, you know, I hope people enjoy it enough to where those opportunities um, present themselves. But this is 100% a band that I, I hope to, I think, one of the unique things about this is uh, none of this music has been performed ever. So in a traditional setting, you as a band getting together in a room, you know, I wrote all this stuff by myself and then put the band together um, and obviously had a lot of guests on the album. Um, you know, um, Jeff Loomis and, and Steve DiGiorgio, Steve plays on Outside the Spiral, did a phenomenal job with Fretless Bass and I just let him choose what song he wanted to play on and, nice. and uh, he chose Spiral. So, uh, and uh, he did such a great job. And so, uh, and I have a lot of, you know, um, a couple of the old atheist guys, uh, you know, played uh, guitar and uh, Yoav, uh, our current bass player, played uh, bass on most of the record. And um, so, uh, yeah, but I, but now this is 100% a band. Uh, and I, you know, I look forward to actually, I think these songs on uh, in a live setting are going to be crushing. I mean, I think that uh, they, they lend themselves to a live setting. So absolutely, 100%. I, I look forward to taking the band out on the road. I'm hoping to, uh, I know this, I'm going to put it out in the universe here, but hopefully 70K. Oh, man. Yeah. That's one of the best gigs ever, no matter what band I'm in. <laughs> yeah. I love, love, love that gig. I mean, yeah. uh, we've, done, we've done it twice, and it's just so fun. And, and um, I always tell people that's the, you know, probably one of the best festivals there is. Bat and Fokken and Hellfest are top three for me, you know, in terms of I've never that. been to the other ones, but I've been to, I've been doing, you know, interviews and press on 70 K since 2011 and absolutely love it. Have and, you ever been? Oh yeah. I've been 11 times. Well, 12, every oh. time. So since 2011, oh, okay. I've been going doing, we press. Need that? yeah, is that absolutely. where we met? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I remember. Um, 
Yeah, what a what a fun time that is, man! I cannot put enough words to to how much fun we have on that thing. Yeah. And uh, even though you got to do two shows, you know, it's it's and sometimes they're you know at three, you know, one one of them was like at three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yep. but, but but uh, you know, there's it's you know it's 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 a uh, heaven for lack of a, a, a better word, you know, because you've got all it's just all people that love what you love, and I remember the seeing that uh, family. Oh my God. Yeah. And you know, when you go to dinner, you know, you're in this really fancy restaurant and I remember looking over and seeing the, uh, I guess what do you call it, the maitre d' or whatever, the walking Kronos to his table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy. Where, the hell, where am I ever going to see that again in my right. life? Or, Kronos is being walked to the table by some guy in a suit. You know? yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. yeah. I love it. And then you go up on the pool deck and you know, there's a, a, a you know, anybody who's anybody is sitting up there, you know, getting some sun, hanging out. And, you know, it's a great way for fans as well to, to meet and, and interact with, uh, with all their favorite metalheads. And, and for me, for me as a guy in a band, I really enjoy meeting all the people as well and having, um, having those great conversations, uh, be it around the pool or in the bar. Or, and, and probably the best thing about 70 K is the, the karaoke. Yeah. The, fucking karaoke man is unbelievable yep. because i mean you got you know you know frank from suffocation singing fucking frank sinatra or, yeah. or you know you got you got you know and it's not your typical you would you know it's not like a bunch of metal guys getting up singing metal songs necessarily <laughs> you know they're yep. they're up singing a bunch of different kinds of things and uh yeah and the jam you know that they put together That's the uh time yeah yeah it's just uh yeah i highly recommend that anybody who's on the fence about going to 70k get your tickets always fun no matter who's playing <laughs> yeah and we're gonna throw it out there till the dirt is my uh i'm throwing it out in the universe man we'll catch you up there yeah, that would be amazing <laughs> <laughs> thank you my friend it's always good seeing you good luck my with pleasure. the record. i'll keep in thank touch you with so you and uh i put it out there we'll see you on the boat thank you so much cheers <laughs> hey, man bye bye oh, out there. yes we're out there everyone i'm hal schwartz and i'm flynn mcclain Together, we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimbut the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!